The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. This podcast is brought to you by Challenger, who believe in providing customers with financial security for a better retirement. Challenger's lifetime annuities provide different payment solutions to suit your client's financial circumstances and needs. For income certainty, they can choose CPI indexed or fixed payments. Alternatively, they can choose to have payments linked to changes in the RBA cash rate or investment markets. Challenger can provide your clients with a monthly income for life so they can enjoy today knowing they'll always have income in the future. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with Deline Jacobides. Uh, Deline is a founder and advisor at Mazzy Wealth, uh, recently started just uh, around six months ago, so keen to chat about you know how that's all come about and how it's going uh, and Deline's also the national vice chair at the association of financial advisors afa Deline, thanks for joining us thanks for having me ben look it's uh, i think it's super interesting you know kicking off a, a business which you you know you started just recently post-covid world started from scratch um so i'm keen to uh yeah to hear like how did that come about um, no doubt we'll get into a bit more about how it's going as well. Yeah. Um, so how it came about, I guess <laughs> I've been an advisor for nine years now and um, an employee and in financial services for 12 years. So I've been in the industry for a little bit. I guess as I had gotten older, gotten more experienced, um, it was just something at the back of my mind that I thought I might want to do. And, um, yeah, with COVID and, uh, you know, that happening, I guess um, it just felt like the right time to do it um, after having my two young children. So I told myself when my daughter was two that I would launch my business. Um, and, yeah, like many other business owners, I guess there's a lot of different motivations behind it. Part of it was being able to... You know, have be a bit more creative, um, be have my own hours, like all those sorts of things. Um, and then the reality of it is, yeah, something different as well, I think. But um, yeah, yeah it's, it's been about five months now. Started at the end of January, um, and like I like, I'm sure many business owners will say, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Um, mm. But it's been good. I'm I'm really excited about um, the future, and I'm I'm excited and happy that I've made the leap. Yeah, nice. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that I think you think about starting a business like, wow, this would be great. I'm going to work, you know, flexibly. I run my own hours and then <laughs> you kick off and you work in like 60, 70 hour weeks, um, you know, trying to do the next thing and the next thing. It's, uh, yeah, it sort of takes a little while to to find your feet. And often, as you said, that the reality is yeah. a, a little bit different. What was the what was the launching process like? Because it's obviously it's pretty scary Um when I started my business, do the same things, started from scratch. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of unknowns there. How was that for you? Yeah, um, I guess I wasn't, uh, like you mentioned with the time thing, I wasn't naive. I knew it would be a lot of work um, to get set up. And I think the biggest thing that made me nervous was 
that I was going from positions where I was fully supported with administration and systems and, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then I would be going into a one woman band where I would be responsible for everything to start with. So um, to be honest, that administration um, part of it really did make me nervous because I wasn't used to sitting there recording when did an FSG go out and mm. you know, recording things like that. So um, that, that did make me a bit nervous, but um, I feel like I finally got into a bit of a, a rhythm already. Um, in terms of launching, so I guess the first thing I did was start to interview different licensees um, to work out, yeah, who I wanted to be licensed with. I knew being self-licensed wasn't something I was interested in doing um you know as a new business um mm. just not wanting to wear that extra hat um there's already enough hats you have to wear when you're starting no. out <laughs> so yeah i started that process probably six months in advance and um start, like started to work out what was important to me with a licensee um so things that ended up being important to me were communication so um wanting to i, I found um, some licensees just never got back to me when I made an inquiry or, <laughs> you know, you'd inquire and then they, you'd have a chat and then not really hear much back from them. Whereas others, yeah, very good communication. So that was important. Um, obviously cost is something that's really important as well when you're starting out because that, mm. that can vary quite significantly. And so it's balancing out the cost versus the support you get from the licensee and technology was something that was important as well. So what yeah what tech did they use um or approve or allow you to use so yeah that's just a couple of examples of things that were that i worked out that were important as time went on um mm. as well as like understanding the rest of the advisors as part of the group who were they or what you know what did they typically do and um yeah just making sure that everyone's values were aligned I remember when I first started my business and like finally it kicked off and I was ready to like crack in and one of the most like the things that made me the most nervous was that in every business that I'd previously worked in, I was getting fed clients like it was prior to starting my business, I was working in, in the, with the mortgage broker and lawyer and the owner of that business was obviously highly motivated to ensure that the financial planning side was successful. Prior to that, I was in a bigger business that had a, did a lot of advertising and had a strong reputation in the marketplace. So um, I was super nervous about that and keen to go like, you know, crack the code and, and figure it out. But talking about admin support, I ended up spending like six hours one day trying to arrange the social icons in my email signature and um, I was like, fuck, where's the IT people to do this stuff? But it's like, there's a million things that you just don't think about that is normally done for you when you start a business that you just immediately responsible for. So yeah, you can. That is so that. funny. Uh, I remember, it. yeah, it took me weeks to figure out where to, cause um, you know, my licensee has all the templates that you need to kind of kickstart yourself, but it took me weeks to figure out where to find a third party authority template from. <laughs> Mm. And it just makes me laugh, like how how long it took me just to find the most basic um, bits of information to get the advice process happening. So, yeah, I'm definitely in a bit more of a rhythm um, now that I know <laughs> where to find everything and complete everything and all my advisor codes are set up with all the different products and insurers and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, hopefully I'm a bit more efficient now than I was five months ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff there to unpack. Um, where are your where are your clients coming from? Yeah, this is an interesting one because um, you did mention that that was something that you were getting client leads previously as an employee. Um, that was something you were used to, and that was similar to me. So I've um, previously worked for businesses that I never had to go and find clients. So, um, however, I wasn't too nervous about that this time around because a few years ago I set up a um, Instagram account and was giving financial education through that Instagram account. And um, so that was probably about two years before I actually started the business. And um, over that two years, uh, I think I've got about 7,000 followers now on that account. And um, over time, people were asking, how can I become a client? Um, but they just weren't the right fit for the businesses that I was working in. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I knew that I wouldn't be 
I wasn't nervous about where to find clients because I knew there was a demand out there. And I think um, given the current advisor numbers, there's, yeah, it's quite easy to find clients. It's just making sure that they're the right client for you, which I guess I'm still trying to work out. So um, I've spoken mm. to a few different advisors who admitted that when you're, when you're starting out, you almost take anybody um, who can, what, what's the saying? That you can fog up a mirror or fog up a window, or whatever the saying is, mm. um, where I, I haven't been quite, I'm quite clear on who I don't want to give advice to. So I've made a decision that I don't want to be giving um, advice on like SMSFs, for example. Um, so happy to have an initial conversation with somebody. And if that's something they're really set on, then I'll refer them to another advisor who does do that. Um, yeah, so there's there's things like that that I'm quite clear on who I don't want to give advice on, but I do want to get more um, clear on who I want to advise moving forward because I am conscious of um, like so far it's been five months and I've got about 30 engagement letters back. So there's no shortage of clients just trying to find time to do the work and also just conscious mm. of capping out too quickly and maybe not having the yeah ideal clients. So um, still working on that. <laughs> Look, I think it, uh, not knowing who you, who isn't the right fit to work with you is is probably half the battle because uh, it's easy, yeah. Especially when you're you're starting from zero revenue uh, on day one, that obviously you, you want to try and build your business quite quickly. But one thing that I found is that when people are like like SMSFs, for example, and we've got a mm. couple of SMSF clients, but. Um, they just take so much time because it's so mm. if you don't if you're not doing it day in and day out you don't have an efficient process around it whereas if you've got an smsf focused business right you can build all your processes systems and tech around that easy enough to do it's like for us with retirees we don't have really hardly any clients with pensions we've mm. got a few legacy ones that we look after again it's just it sort of breaks our mold and it means that mm. it either you run it unprofitably or you charge much more than what a specialist business would do. So, mm. um, yeah, I think niching helpful, but um, you know, cutting out the the people that aren't the right fit is uh, is a, is a big part of that. Good um, start. Yeah, and that was a complete. I, I agree with that. I, I knew I wouldn't be doing it efficiently. Um, where I have worked for a business that specialised in SMSFs before, so we could do it efficiently and had the right team, but I wouldn't be able to do that now. Um, looking at my client list at the moment, I've got about 40% of them are single females. Um, so I am attracting a lot of single females and that's a combination of people who are, have chosen not to partner or um, have been divorced or widowed or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got about 20% retirees, like retiree couples, I should say, and then the other 40% are, I guess, like professional um, families. And so I would say about 60% of my clients have come through from social media and then the other 40% have been word of mouth referrals from existing clients. So it's been a, a mixture. And what did you do? So you build a following on Insta um, and, and across socials and then obviously you kicked off your business. Did you have a mm. launch strategy or what did you do to, to sort of pull those clients in or pull those conversations into the business? Yeah, so leading up to that point when people would ask for advice, um, I would refer them on to other advisors I know and I had a few different friends that I would refer to. Um, and then as once I made the decision that I was going to be um, starting this business, I would just let people know, yep, happy to give you a referral to somebody I trust because a big part of it was people not knowing who to trust. Mm. Um, and so I would say I can ha I'm happy to refer you to somebody, um, but if you want to work with me in the future, I'm planning to launch in January 2022. Um, and if you're happy to wait then, then I can look after you. So I kind of already had a bit of a wait list happening before I even started. Um, and then in terms of launching, I just, I, I guess I just told everybody I've now started, I'm taking on clients and, um, yeah, just, um, was, yeah, I felt, I felt a bit inundated to start with, to be honest. Um, and yeah, that's significantly been... better than the alternative though. So well done. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's great. 
yeah. what does a typical day look like for you at the moment and, and how do you go about you know managing your time between doing what you need to do to to work on your business plus mm. working with clients and wearing all of those uh, all of those hats you mentioned before yeah, I've actually been going through the AIA executive wellness program thing that they've got going on. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but um, basically it's um, as they invited me in with a 10 or 15 other people to go through a bit of a program around um, learning how to work smarter and better and um, be a bit more um I guess, optimized with your energy and how you work. Okay. So I've been learning yeah. some great tips from that. We're only okay. a few sessions in. Um, but what I have learned from that is um, because, as you mentioned, you can be doing long hours as an advisor to start with or as a business owner. So I've learned mm. to do the real heavy thinking in the daytime and then mm-hmm. do the easy type of tasks like filling in forms at nighttime when I don't have to be thinking like strategically. It's more just like copying the data correctly into the forms. Mm-hmm. So um, I try and leave the sort of more administrative tasks for the nighttime um, when the kids have gone to bed and I've ju- I jump back on for a few hours. Um, and then, yeah, client meetings during the day. A lot are done via Microsoft Teams online, um, but then I do have a handful of retirement retirees in Brisbane um, that want to meet face-to-face. So I've just got a serviced office that I'm renting a spot from um, when I need to do those meetings. Um, So yeah, this comes down to, again, like having those different processes that makes you less efficient, I guess. And that's Mm. part of the journey of trying to work out, well, what do I want to, which direction do I want to go in? Yeah, and so it is a a bit of a mixture in terms of the work that you do every day, but um, I have been learning to block out more of my calendar so I know Mm. that I've got a whole day to work on, you know, power planning requests, like the the best interest duty submissions. Yeah, (laughs) and then um, try and have meetings all on the same day because I find that if I've got a meeting and then I have to switch back into like this, administration mindset after mm. that meeting i find that very hard to do i don't know if if other advisors yeah. are like that are you are you like that totally yeah i tend to i don't do tons of client meetings these days but when i do i bank them up um and i do that because even going between that and content or marketing or team stuff it's i feel like it's it is you got to shift your focus shift your attention and and get back into the groove so yeah um i i've found that to be quite helpful i've had the default diary thing for for a long time and it's changed a lot but depending on you know what needs my focus in the business or what needs to to happen but it I think for me, that's probably been the biggest hack, especially with your mm. clients. Like you got these ongoing clients and ongoing relationships that you you want to look, you want to make sure that they're provided for. But you also have targets around like your new clients and the work that you're doing, and then you review clients as well. So before I did that, I had just had stuff going everywhere in my calendar. But then I started going, okay, well, how many clients do I want to? How many new clients do I want to be able to onboard each week? How many reviews should I be doing each week? How many ongoing clients do I? have and therefore how many you know meetings do I need to put time aside for and then I just tried to um, set that up in the calendar and it didn't work 100% of the time but it probably worked 80% of the time and that's that was enough and it's funny that I I think that it's really easy that I'd been in the thinking that I need to be you know super flexible and I think it is important to be flexible but for clients I found that they they sort of use the flexibility that you give them and if in periods where I'd just been inflexible because I had to be because there was stuff going on, but people would just conform to whatever needed to happen at that time. And then I started saying, well, hold on a sec now, um, if that works, well, I may as well just do that all the time. And then it allows Mm -hmm. me to, you know, do what you need to do and be more efficient as well. Yeah, I'm nodding my head so much to all of this because I can relate. It's only been a few months in and I can relate to this. Um, I think people don't mind having to wait a few weeks for appointments if you've blocked out your calendar because you've got other stuff going on. So um, because at the start, I was like, you just kept my calendar open and let people book in via Calendly, um, you know, for introductory calls or initial discovery meetings. But then that 
causes you to be um, almost unproductive with the day because you're stopping mm. and starting. So, yeah, I've learned quite quickly to block out time to focus on different things. And um, like you said, people don't mind waiting for a few weeks if they need to. Mm. Calendly does have good availability scheduling as well. So I've used that pretty mm. extensively that it's like when I was doing the intro chats of the business, it's like they can only happen you know, after 10 a.m. and they can't happen within two days of being booked and, you know, they don't go past this time or whatever. Yes. Uh, again, found that to be pr- pretty helpful. So you Definitely. mentioned you mentioned kids and, and family there. I'm interested, like, because I started my business before I had kids and thankful that and I was telling you a bit of background before we, we fired up the camera, but um, when I started planning to have a family, I was like, shit, I need a team now to, uh, to help with some of these things so I don't have to be on the one, the, the one on the hook for all of the stuff. How do you go about finding the balance? Because your kids are young, right, like five and three, mm. so um, mm. that's pretty full on. How, how, do, you, how do you tackle it? Yeah. Um, well, firstly, I think that I've got some good um, support network around me. So my husband is, um, you know, very involved and does half the domestic and home duties. Um, totally. Yeah, he is. Don't tell him enough to his face. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, the kids go to childcare. So, you know, I don't have to worry about the school pick up time at this point because I know that's a challenge I'll have to deal with next year when my eldest goes to school. And then in terms of, yeah, like you mentioned, starting your day, I, I do tend to not have appointments too early in the morning and try and block out time in the morning to go and exercise and look after myself first before I start the day. Because I know once I start working, I won't be able to pull myself away to go do some exercise so you know that's kind of important to look after myself because if I can't do that I'm not going to be much use for everybody else um and then yeah trying not to work late every night once the kids have gone to sleep and just doing it you know a couple of times um but we'll admit I am working a lot on the weekends as well initially um not again trying not to do that every weekend because I feel like there's always going to be work there to work on Mm. um so it's just trying to set some boundaries for myself <laughs> as much totally. as possible. Mm. Mm. That's like the, one of the most effective dieting strategy is just to use smaller dinner plates. So I th- feel like if you, oh, yeah. if you got, if you don't put boundaries around your time, then, um, you know, you just end up using more time. Whereas it, when you do, it's like you got a four day week or you're trying to get something done because you, you're going away on leave for a week or two. It's like, it's amazing how productive you are in that time because you know Correct. that it needs to happen and you just, uh, you just make it happen. So again, I think that's yeah, time blocking, um, definitely. Blocking. I think in a financial year is a bit like that when you know there's this deadline coming up, so you've just got to get in and get it done. <laughs> mm, totally. Um, I know that it's only early days in your business, but if you could go back to, you know, the 1st of January, is there anything that you would do differently? Um, I think at the beginning I was quite nervous about finding clients. <laughs> Even though I kind of had this wait list and this, you know, I knew there were people that were very keen to work with me from social media, but I I was quite nervous starting up with zero clients. But I think at the start, I would have just maybe put the brakes on a little bit and not tried to take on so many clients to start with because I really underestimated how much time it would take to get set up, to go through things like the whole pre-vet process with compliance with the licensee, getting set up, Mm. all my advisor codes getting reset up. So all that kind of stuff took so much time and I really underestimated how much of my time it would take up. So if I could go back then... Um, I would have slowed down on taking on new clients to get all that working um, because, like, you really can't do some of that stuff until after you've joined your new licensee. Mm. Um, And because I I did take on so many clients to start with, like, I've still got this bit of a backlog in terms of SOAs. I need to get out to people and, um, you know, formally onboard them, I guess. And so, yeah, I think I would have just tried to slow that down to mm. get everything set up properly so there's not this backlog. <laughs> I feel like that's a lesson that you can take. It doesn't really matter what stage of your business that you're at, but um, if you, you know, you've only got a certain amount of capacity with the resources that are there, especially if you want to, you know, not work a million hours a week and, mm. and to find any sort of balance that I've gone through periods and 
um, especially in the COVID middle of the pandemic piece was one of them where we, our business sort of seized up essentially at the start of COVID with everyone, you know, fully bunkered down and panic buying, you know, toilet paper and all the thinking the world's going to (laughs) win. But then on the other side of it, people just started going ballistic and we had so many people that wanted to work with us, particularly because it had been quiet. We tried to onboard like 30 clients over a couple of months and, it was just chaos because there's so much going on that your resources are stretched too thin. And a lesson we took from that is that you've got to know your capacity and work to that. It's incredibly frustrating as a business owner that you're essentially delaying revenue when you, you know, you work so hard and you really want your business to succeed. And that success is in a big part is like get more clients, work with more people. Um, So it is, yeah, it's certainly frustrating, but, um, ultimately from doing that you you give a better experience and then get better results for your clients get more referrals get better results from the business as well and as you say that sometimes people they're not they want to know that the things are happening but they don't mind to wait if they need to as well and in fact they probably prefer to if it meant that they're going to get looked after better than better, something yeah. that's right because you're stretched thin so i think uh from day one, yes, but it's probably something for you to keep in mind as you 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 know building a team and business momentum builds as well. Definitely, I think that is a good lesson to take once I do start employing people because there's going to be that period of having to train people and um, learning to work together. So you're absolutely right. Mm. Delene, how have you gone about building your like learning and and building your knowledge, you know, as an advisor and now as a business owner? Um, yeah, so well, I mean, as an advisor, I learned a lot um, on the job through different businesses, um, being mentored by different advisors. So um, that was like the informal sort of training and then, you know, having my CFP and doing those sort of official studies as well. Um, that was like the formal side of it. But I guess moving into a business, um, there's a whole range of different things to learn there and so um, I really uh, have fallen onto my networks Um, so different advisors that I've met through different associations or different groups um, really you know picked people's brains from that Um, and so part of that has been the connections I've got through the AFA um, so other members there so uh, for example John Kasher really good friends with him he happens we both happen to be licensed with the same licensee so that was a pure coincidence that ended up that way um but yeah he's the the chair of um the national practitioners committee um with afa and so um you know he's somebody i look to a lot from a business perspective or a business mentoring perspective because he's been in business for like i don't even know how many years now <laughs> um his Since baby so, face is just not many, but I know the truth to be otherwise. Yeah, long time. Um, so, yeah, building on those, I guess falling onto those connections has really helped, um, which is why we um, have launched the AFA community group in the XY platform. So um, it's only newly launched, but that has, um, we've set that up so that people can uh, build their networks a little bit more. So. AFA has typically done a lot of face-to-face networking events and various um, in-person events. Um, Mm. And so we kind of just wanted to expand on that and create an online community as well to complement it Um, because, yeah, like John, for example, is in Melbourne. I'm in Brisbane, yet we speak every few days um, around various things. So having Mm. that online, especially in the post-COVID world, like during that COVID two year I think it's we can say we're kind of past it now but yeah during those couple of years there a lot of people did move online because there weren't as many in-person events um, totally and I think so, there still isn't and I think advisors have got super slack when it comes to um and I think as a society we've got probably got pretty slack when it comes to just like social interactions and engagement I know I just I definitely have probably just my inner introvert <laughs> Uh, now thriving but um i think that the, there is there are less events but also just because we're so used to our bunker life that it's like people that just don't go to as as many things either so uh yeah. i know with the xy group and with the afa i've 
been involved with them for a lot of years. Like, uh, loved getting, you know, pressing the flesh, and that was just what you did as it as advisors. But it's really not what a lot of people are doing, you know, in that post COVID environment. Yeah, that's it. So yeah, we're not trying to take away from the in person stuff because some people do love that. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, I guess, opening up the borders and allowing advisors all ar- across the country because there's not that many of us left. Um, so just helping to build those connections and networks and sort of complement the in-person stuff um so we've got that so if anyone's interested in joining that's part of the afa and wants to get involved in that um i don't don't know if there's like a link that we can put into the (laughs) podcast notes or something like that i don't know how it works yeah (laughs) Um, Yeah. but it's also on the platform right so if you search on the xy platform afa you should find it. I think we'll find a link. I think so. <laughs> um, tell us about, because you guys have been working on this financial literacy program with the AFA as well. Tell mm. us a bit about how that's come about and, and what um, what it actually is. Yeah, so um, we're working on a financial literacy program, as you mentioned. It's um, still in its early days, um, but when we've spoken to advisors and um, the association and various people in the industry, um, everyone seems pretty excited about it. So I think it's a fair comment to say that many advisors would love to be um, doing more in this space. So they'd love to be um, giving, you know, more education to general Australians, helping more people, you know, educating their local communities um, and, yeah, like helping the next, you know, the young the young generations so that we've got, um, I guess, more financially illiterate Australians. Um, so I think, I think that's a fair comment. But the issue we've got is that so many advisors are busy. They're time poor. They're running their businesses. They've got so many other priorities that they're trying to work on so they don't really have the time to dedicate towards this so what we're trying to do as um, the practitioners committee is build out a framework so um, and a financial literacy program so that advisors can kind of just pick it up and deliver it Um, so we're still in the early days of it but in ideally in our mind um, we would like to be able to set it up with different organizations um so that an advice we can just simply say here's a here's a time slot we need an advisor to go speak at this school or speak at this event and then an advisor can sort of, sort of step in and just deliver the the content um, that's i guess the ideal end goal and i think it's great because it helps to build not only it helps people be more financially literate so that they can you know set themselves up to be um successful financially but to be in a sort of position that can afford to get good quality help from advisors with obviously with the cost of advice increasing significantly over the last few years and likely to continue on that path as advisor numbers shrink over time but i think as a getting the message out that um advice is here to help and building that trust in the profession i think it's great to see that happening through these community groups as well and we're just chatting a little bit offline, but I think, you know, historically that that stuff has happened, but often comes attached with alignment with some sort of specific product or company Mm. solution that comes off the back of it. So yeah, I think it's, it's great to see. And also, yeah, fully agree with those comments that advisors time poor and have wrapping all of the content up in a nice bow for them to just tweak and put their spin on is uh, helpful as opposed to someone trying to reinvent the wheel. So for people that are to to learn more or maybe get involved potentially in that program, what's the best way for them to learn about that? Um, Yeah, well, get involved in the AFA XY group. I think that would be a good start because we'll be posting more information in there. But then also, yeah, just get in touch with me or John um, or Ronnie was on the last one of the last podcasts as well. Um, So I think he might have mentioned being involved in this as well. So, yeah, get in touch with one of us and we can talk about how, yeah, you can learn more and get involved. Like I mentioned, it's still early days, but then happy to keep, if anyone's interested in in knowing more, happy to keep them in the loop as we develop this or if if they want to join and, yeah, get involved. Um, I think you really hit the nail on the head as we were talking offline a big part of us wanting to do this um, is around improving the reputation of financial advice in Australia. We've had such a 
a bad rap in the past, um, the last few years, and it is picking up, I think, from what I read and hear, but um, there's still some more work to be done in that reputation um, area. And then, um, as you mentioned, making sure that we do have um, financial, financially literate Australians so that they can afford advice in the future and they understand the value of, of advice uh, unless mm. a lot of people don't realise the value until they actually get advice and go through the process. Mm. Um, mm. So I think if people can see, everyday people can see what we are doing as advisors as a whole um, and if we're all sort of on the same page and delivering the same information and message and content, that's only going to imp to help us all rather than having different messages or different information that we're spreading and things like that. Mm. Or even just helping advise, uh, consumers know what advice actually is, is would probably yeah. be a starting <laughs> point as well. I know it's, get it, it's not easy with every advisor doing things a little bit differently, but mm. um, that confusion, I think, leads to people not taking advantage when they when they should. So it's great to mm. um, yeah, great to see that work happening. And I agree that I think it, the the reputation is increasing as advisors are somewhat forced to um, focus more on you know higher value, higher impact work as an uplift in the you know the standards and advice. So I think as that starts to filter mm -hmm. through to consumers, they spread the word at their end. Initiatives like this one help um, you know get that exposure more broadly. Really awesome to see, and well done for you know making the time to drive that sort of stuff while you're you know managing a young family and a baby business as well. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> well done. But Delene, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Super pumped to to see where the where the journey takes you, and yeah, really look forward to hearing about it again on the next one. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Ben.